Joe Burns. Welcome. Uh, hello, sisters and brothers. Um, I'm just going to start off with a little uh, anecdote and then uh, and then go on from there. Uh, I spoke at a class of Professor Noel Kent, who's over here in the room, uh, a couple classes the other day at the University of Hawaii, and a lot of you know young students there. And we were talking to them and asked them how many knew about unions or had any experience with unions. And it was, to me, very striking that uh, you know, in the first class, no one really had any any interactions with unions, and then in the second class, a couple kids or young students did, but their interaction was just really tangential. So they had been one of them had been at a construction site, and there were some union guys there, and had not necessarily a positive experience with it because the union guys had benefits and they didn't. And to me, that really said a lot about the state of the labor movement today and really a lot of uh, what our tasks are as uh, trade unionists as, and as trade union supporters. And it makes sense that that would be the case because if you look at the numbers uh, nationwide, only six out of every hundred private sector worker is in a union. And uh, here on Hawaii, you have the third highest uh, overall unionization rate in, in the country. So like, including public workers, you have 22%, uh, but that's still only one out of five. And in the private sector, it's 14%. So basically, what we have today is a labor movement that uh, represents a small segment of the working population and consequently, has uh, relatively uh, less power than it ha than it had in the past, and that's really borne out in terms of views of trade unions in society. So the latest Gallup poll that came out showed a slight increase, but the numbers are still really bad in terms of only 52 percent of Americans have a positive view of trade unions. Um, but so, but then you start looking back in, in labor history, which is really what I what I've done in my book, in this book, and my next book that'll be coming out next spring, and you know started looking back for answers because in the 1950s, 75 percent of Americans had a positive view of trade unions, and that makes sense because back in the 1950s, trade unions uh, represented. Um, one out of every three workers, and they set the wage standards for millions and millions of workers uh, beyond that. So, so you start looking back for, for answers. And just to give you a little bit, bit of background about myself, um, I grew up in a working class neighborhood in uh, North Minneapolis. And when I was growing up, I didn't really realize it at the time, but the strike had made possible an entire way of life uh, for, for my family and for uh, others in my neighborhood. It was back there where you know, uh, someone could work in a warehouse or they could be a truck driver and they could, you know, they could have a pension. My dad was a cop and, you know, he ended up dying when I was young, but, I, but my mom had and we had a policeman's pension to fall back on. And that's all because of the union and in reality, uh, even more so uh, because it was based on a labor movement that had developed a powerful strike. So um, following that, I went on to university and became a hospital worker, a public employee uh, uh, in, a, in a hospital, and uh, became local union president. Uh, and following that, you know, I did that for about 10 years, and then I went to law school at New York University. And I was there when I really first started thinking about, you know, writing a book, because when I was in law school, I always knew that labor law was tilted against workers. Um, but it was in, where in law school I really started to see labor law as constituting what I call in my book a system of labor control, a system that no longer functions to uh, support union activity but really controls the most effective and traditional trade union activity. So I started writing the book, um, which is Reviving the Strike, and as I started writing it became less and less about just about the law and more about trade union theory and practice and kind of like how, how did we used to do things and why have we abandoned you know, traditional methods. And key among them was the strike. Because if you look back for the first 150 years of trade unionism in the United States, 
It would have been inconceivable to think of having a trade union movement that wasn't based on the strike because they were very much uh, inseparable. The strike was how folks won their unions. It was workers coming together and they would strike for recognition and if they had enough power, they would win the strike and if they didn't, then you know those who went back to work could get back to work. Um, but, but in general, that was really the basis of the trade union movement. So looking back at traditional labor economists, they shared that view. So if you look at Albert Rees writing a labor textbook in 1960 or 62, um, says the, the strike is by far the most important source of union power. And that was really traditional understanding. And indeed, if you look at the period from the 1930s through the 1970s, trade unionists were able to use a powerful strike to really redistribute wealth in, in American society and also provide a better way of life for millions of working class Americans. Uh, and in the 1930s, uh, employers resisted unionization, just like they do today. Uh, but employees, there was like a wave of strike in Otto in the early 1930s. Um, some of them were successful, some weren't. There was a series of uh, strikes in 1934 in key United States cities. So we had Minneapolis, where I'm from, had the Minneapolis trucker strike, which was basically a little general strike within the city that shut the city down. You had the West Coast ports uh, having a having a, a, a citywide strikes, general strikes. Uh, and out of those battles, uh, and out of you know battles in auto and sit down strikes and so forth, the modern labor movement was born. So it was very much born of the strike. Uh, and if you look at the period following that, if you fast forward uh, you know, through the 1940s and 1950s, what you see is that uh, unions uh, fought very hard to get what they, want, what, they, what they wanted. So when you think of people getting pensions and, and employer provided health care and so forth, that was due to not because, as some people used to say, because there was this big labor People used to say there was this labor management accord in the 1950s and it was kind of this peace and the unions were bought off. But when you really, and that was kind of prevailing, you know, I think in the 1980s when I was getting uh, started in the labor movement. But a lot of people are really questioning that today because if you look back at labor history, what you see is that workers struck repeatedly in the 1950s. So there was, uh, on average, uh, 350 strikes of over 1,000 workers. Um, and numerous, numerous more smaller strikes. And if you compare that to the last decade or so, uh, there's been an average of 10 strikes per year. So you go from 350 strikes involving millions of lost work days to a situation in the last decade where um, very, very few workers are, are striking and consequently, we have very, very little bargaining power um, when you sit down and negotiate with management and try and win the sort of things that we want, such as you know, living wages and, and better health care and work rules and so forth. Um, and the 1950s and 1960s, it was really an incredible period when you think about it because um, unions were able to negotiate these contracts that covered entire industries. So you would get 500,000 workers under one trucking contract nationwide. And what it would do is it would just stabilize the entire industry. It would provide a platform uh, uh, for everybody. And you wouldn't have this competition you know, um, based on wages between the firms. And, and, it, and it really provided for uh, stability. So what happened? You know, I guess that, that, that's the question. Um, why is it that? And this is one of the questions that I really you know, wanted to address in my book. Why is it that the strike was so powerful uh, in the 1930s uh, up through the 1970s? It's something that employers feared. And today, the strike is something that employers use to scare workers into not forming a union, where they say, if you form a union, they're just going to take you out on strike. Um, and it's something that, that is supposed to scare people. And when, you, when I look back on it, what I came to understand is that the strike today looks very, very different than the historical strike. And it's not that the strike can't succeed, it's just that we no longer are allowed to use 
traditional and effective forms of strike activity. And let me just uh, go through a couple points of the traditional strike just to give you an idea of it. Um, the, the first is the traditional strikes were often industry-wide. So if you look at the 1946 sugar strike here in Hawaii, um, that involved 23,000 workers on all of the islands, and if you count the families, it probably had a quarter of the island's population at the time, according to the, there was a really good book that I just read. I read that as well this week, that, that um, um, Fighting in Paradise. Um, so, uh, so anyway, so, so you would have these industry-wide strikes. So like in 1959, all of the steel workers in the United States go out on strike at once. 500,000 steel workers strike, you know, hundreds of steel companies um, for 100 some days. And the reason that that was important is by engaging in those really large strikes pulling out an entire industry, you're able to use worker solidarity. So you're not striking like today. Um, we, we, I was just talking about there's a, there was a strike in, let's say, 2004 in Jefferson, Wisconsin. And in that strike, workers at one meatpacking plant were forced to go up against a giant corporation. Now obviously, compare the two situations. One, you have hundreds of thousands of workers taking on an entire industry, and then in the other, you have these isolated, narrow strikes where a handful of workers try and take on multinational corporations. Now that form of striking, not surprisingly, is not very effective today, and as a matter of fact, it wouldn't have been effective you know, 50 or 100 years ago. It's just we have a lot more power. That's really the point of unionism is to work together. So the other set, so that's one, one aspect of solidarity that workers were able to use. And the second um, type of solidarity that was key to the labor movement was what I call workplace-based solidarity. And by that, what I mean is the, the law refuse, refers to it as secondary activity. So you talk about secondary strikes and secondary boycotts. Um, and just to give you a brief example of that and why it's so powerful is, let's say I work at a brewery of, um, making beer and uh, we go out on strike. Now today, if you went out on strike, you would put out leaflets and you would try and convince millions of customers to boycott the beer. Now that's hard because you exist in a national product market and it's just hard to get that many people to agree to boycotts, um, to, to not use that beer. But traditionally what the labor movement would do is they wouldn't have to convince millions of consumers, they would use workers' power as workers on the work site um, to be able to use their solidarity. So it wouldn't be something people did after work, it would be they would go out and say to the, the brewery workers, would say to the Teamster truck drivers, hey, we're on strike, um, please honor our picket line and don't deliver that staff produced beer. And they would honor it, and then the company wouldn't be able to sell it, or else they would block you know, the, the products from coming in, but workers were able to work together. If they wanted to go a step further, they would put up a picket sign at a local bar, and they would ask the bartender's union to honor their picket line and to go out on strike. Not because the bartenders were mad at their individual employer, but because they were asking them uh, just to get rid of the beer. Um, or they would ask the customers, don't come into this working class bar uh, until they get rid of the beer. Now they didn't, by doing that, they didn't have to convince millions of people, right? All they had to do was convince one person, the owner of the bar. And the owner of the bar had a simple solution. You don't, wanna, you don't wanna be picketed, just put another beer on tap, and they would separate themselves from the dispute. And that's why these tactics were so powerful for the labor movement. And I mean, there's a lot more examples that I cover in the book, but basically, I think you get the general idea is, the labor movement had these really powerful forms of striking, and guess what happened? Uh, employers used their influence in Congress and the courts to outlaw basically every effective tactic of striking and trade unionism. So tactics such as blocking the, the plant cakes, mass picketing with a bunch of people, those get enjoined by courts. Um, these, these tactics um, were uh, outlawed as part of the 1940s Taft-Hartley Act. 
um, which was a union busting act. So sometimes the sometimes the legislature did it, you know, the, the Congress did it, and sometimes the courts did it. They didn't have to have legislation because a lot of times courts would come up with decisions that really were pro-employer. So over the over the course of 80 years, um, they basically managed to, uh, to to outlaw effective strike activity. So so the problem we face as trade unionists is by the 1980s the rules of the game are rigged. And at that time, in the, in the 1970s, beginning in the 1970s, but really picking up steam in the later 70s, um, US employers start seeing that crisis of profitability and really start going on, on the attack against unions. And by the time they start attacking unions in, 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 in with, uh, with fervor, um, the rules are really on their side. So unions try and fight back in industry after industry, uh, but end up getting permanently replaced. And you know, folks may be familiar with the term, you're supposed to be protected under labor law. Like the National Labor Relations Act says the right to strike is a, is a protected right. Um, but the courts have come up with this uh, idea, it's this legal fiction they've created that that somehow employers can permanently replace workers, and they're not really firing them, they're just permanently replacing them. So you really can try and you know, figure out the difference. I, I, don't, I, I don't really you know, consider it a, a big distinction. I mean, there is a distinction in terms of um, if there's jobs down the road, then you can get them back, but for most workers, that really doesn't, doesn't really cut it. So, so anyway, so, you, so you've got this whole series of, of decisions that are, that are um, that are anti-worker. You've got a situation by the 1980s that unions, um, you know, they start they start busting unions in industry after industry. One unions try and strike. Um, the employers use the rules against them. They end up losing the strikes. They use a whole set of legal rules where they can shut down a plant like a mine, and then if the new owner opens it up non-union, then all of a sudden the union's supposed to go away and no one has their job. They did that in hotels and a lot of other industries. So it's really these unfair set of rules that, that are rigged against us. So, so anyway, so, so that's really kind of the, the, the basis of my book. And what my book argues is that we need to really, we, we can't have a labor movement, which is what we've tried for the last 20 years, up until like last year. There was this idea that we could just fight smarter within the system and we could do all this organizing and we could do this community outreach and stuff, but we could, we could ignore the essential question of, we don't have bargaining power if we don't have the strike. We have to have an ability to make employers um, respect workers. And I, I work full time as a bargainer, you know, I, I negotiate labor contracts, and I can tell you, I can sit there at the bargaining table and I can make the biggest argument that makes the most sense in the world, and they don't care. You know, they'll just sit and look at you and they'll say, well, we're not moving off our proposal, unless you have some sort of power, some sort of an ability to, to hurt them financially, and traditionally that was the strength. So <laughs> let me move on a little bit and, uh, and, and talk about you know, some ideas about, about where we go from here. Um, one of the things that I did after I wrote this book is I started writing another book. Um, I guess once you start writing, you just keep going. And the, the next uh, area that I looked at was the 1960s. And it was something I, even though I was a public employee and a, and a union leader, I really didn't know that much about it. Um, but there was like an incredible upsurge of unionism in the 1960s and 70s. And it was really one of the great upsurges of union history. And I started studying that. And I've got a book coming out next year that's called Strike Back. Um, and it's got a big long subtitle about um, the fine, using the militancy of the 1960s to reignite public employee unionism. But it basically, what it does is, I think I'll just touch on a couple, couple points from it. Um, and the first is that, and this is something that other folks have wrote, written about, um, if you're going to think about how do we change the situation and how do we revive the labor movement, um, one, of the, one of the points is that the labor movement has traditionally grown by, by great upsurges. So um, Dan Clausen wrote a book called The Next Upsurge about 10 years ago, and he pointed out that most years in US history, unions are declining, you know, slightly declining or, or more sharply declining. 
And then every once in a while, there's like a new way of doing things, and they grow exponentially. So like, you know, they grew four times their number in the 1930s. And if you look at public employees in the 1960s, they went from 9% of the workers being organized into unions and very weak in the late 1960s, there were hardly any strikes at all. I mean, there were zero teacher strikes in 1958. There was only a three strikes in the entire country on average uh, during that period. Um, but yet, within the course of a decade, there was like this explosion of activity. And it's really an amazing history where even though strikes were illegal in every state in the United States and the federal government, all throughout the 1960s, um, there was a slight Vermont allowed some in that starting in 68. But really, the first state to allow striking was Hawaii uh, in 1970, where they legalized striking. But yet, during that period, hundreds of thousands of workers engaged in illegal strikes. So I think we can, and what they did is, they did it based on a, on a notion and a belief that their right to strike was a fundamental human right and that these restrictions on their right to strike were illegitimate. So I think that's one thing we can learn from the period. Um, it's inconceivable to me, um, as a trade unionist, as a labor lawyer, um, as someone who's studied labor history, it's inconceivable to me that we're gonna be ultimately able to um, revive the labor movement without some forms of civil disobedience or some sort of mass defiance of unjust labor laws. Because basically, if the rules are rigged and you're playing a game of poker or whatever, and the cards are stacked against you, it doesn't matter how good a poker player you are, and I like poker, um, you're gonna lose be because the, the game is rigged. And the, the labor law in this country is rigged against workers. And I think if you talk to uh, most labor lawyers and you ask them, or labor-friendly law professors, you, you're gonna get that. You're gonna get that answer. Now they won't tell you what you should do because they're representing their clients, and that's fair. And I do that too. Um, but nonetheless, um, so that's one thing we can learn from them. And the other thing is we can learn from this period is how did they do it? I mean, it's it's really amazing that these workers were able to um, to engage in the sort of mass defiance uh, of labor law and, and win. And I'll just give you one little story uh, of, from the period. Um, one of the first strikes in uh, Washington State of teachers was in this little town called Evergreen, Wisconsin, or Evergreen, Evergreen Washington. And the teachers decided to go out on strike. And what happened was the, the uh, school district went to court and they issued an injunction. And basically it became anyone who violated the injunction should go to jail. So they put the first uh, union president in jail and who was a teacher. And then they appointed another one. And they put that person in jail too. And then they found a teacher who was like, um, looked like a, I mean, she was a 65 year old, gray hair, um, very proper, never arrested in her life. And, they, and she was union president. And she went to court and he was gonna throw her in jail. So what they did is they took every teacher, was lined up, they brought a book with them and a toothbrush and one pair of pajamas with them, and they all marched down to the courthouse. And they said, if you're gonna arrest her, you have to arrest, arrest each and every one of us. And the judge is like, well, what are we gonna do? So what he decided to do is he told the school board, if you don't negotiate with the union, we're gonna put you in jail. <laughs> and that's really kind of, that story was replicated in, in city after city after city um, where workers, were able to use you know, their solidarity. Or in Philadelphia, the police went around and they took vans and they arrested. They pulled out, they, went, they hit all the schools where teachers were picketing and they, they arrested all the teachers. They just pulled them into the vans. So they arrested like hundreds of teachers. Well, the Central Labor Council in Philadelphia, which isn't exactly radical back in the mid 1970s, um, said that they were gonna do a, a day of conscience, which was a general strike 
of all the unions in the city. Well, guess what? They ended up backing down and they agreed to a contract with the teachers union and they won their union. So basically, I, I think there's, there, there's a lot of examples um, from the period, which I really won't go into. Um, and I, I think I'll just, I'll just end with a, with a couple points. Um, in, in the last year or so, there's been some exciting trends within the labor movement. You've seen for, for about 15 years, people had basically, not every union, I mean, there's unions um, that were using strike activity strategically. Um, the hotel workers are, are probably the best example of like a, a union you know, using a coordinated strike and boycott activity uh, very, very well to organize uh, and, and defend uh, their contracts and expand them. But, but in general, the labor movement had abandoned the strike. Well, in the last uh, year or so, um, we've seen really exciting new trends. So we've seen the Walmart, the all Walmart organizing, which is very exciting because they're really looking back into labor history and saying, you know, we're not gonna rely on just the government to tell us when we have a union. We're gonna form an organization. We're using strikes strategically to, to help us win um, and to inspire confidence in workers. Um, and likewise, uh, the restaurant workers have uh, also done that in a number of U.S. cities, um, where you know they're doing citywide strikes. All the stuff that I, you know, that I'm kind of talking about about how unions used to do it, they're doing it. Now, obviously, it's on a smaller scale. They're one-day strikes. Um, they've got a lot of obstacles against them. But you know, those those sort of signs uh, in the labor movement give me hope because. Um, not only is it you know, using a more member-driven sort of activity, but it's also actions that are geared towards younger workers, that it's you know, reaching industries that you know, unions aren't really relevant and trying to make them relevant. So for those reasons, uh, you know, I think uh, hopefully we've seen some hopeful signs here in the labor movement. All right, thank you. government workers uh, up until 1970 did not have the legal right to strike. Okay. Yeah. Hawaii was the first one. Yeah. Uh, Hawaii, yeah, it was Hawaii, a lot of books credit Hawaii, it was Hawaii, Pennsylvania, Vermont had a little bit, but, but Hawaii was the, uh, among the first thing. And, and okay, in 1970 what? 1970. Yeah, in 1968, uh, I'll just do a brief In 1968, the Hawaii Constitution was amended uh, to include the right to organize for public workers. Uh, the legislature refused to take action, so um, a couple thousand uh, blue-collar workers, state workers, went out on strike. Um, they still didn't take action. Then two years later, and this is really kind of a cool story, um, the legislature was in session and they were voting on whether to allow the right to strike. Well, 13,000 public workers went out on strike and they marched down to the state legislature and surrounded the Capitol while they were voting on whether or not public workers should get their right to strike. So that's how they won their right to strike in Hawaii. Okay, thank you.